This week on The Gadget Show. I get rough with some of the toughest camcorders on the market. How much torture can they take? Jason and John give you the definitive guide to buying a laptop. And Tom Dunmore checks out some pretty impressive USB accessories on the critical list. But first, me. One of the things we're a bit partial to on The Gadget Show is taking devices that claim to be rugged for some extreme testing. We've barbecued them. We've run them over. We've soaked them again and again. And of course, we've blown them up. Now we're going to turn the screw on one of the most delicate gadgets around, the camcorder. Peer inside a traditional tape camera and you're confronted with an assortment of breakable, delicate little parts. This is not a gadget built for the rigours of an active lifestyle. But there is the technology to make very tough cameras and the police and the military are taking full advantage. This eyeball cam is used by the police in the US. It can be thrown or rolled into any dangerous situation. It can film on a 360 degree rotation and if it lands upside down, you can just flip the image. In the world of television though, this is the man you call if you need cameras that can survive the most extreme abuse. His name is Jonathan Watts and his kit is built to endure almost anything. And what about this camera over here that you've made? Well, this was um, uh, engineered out of PVC. It's a waterproof camera um, and we use this for things like crocodiles and sharks and things like that because and one's had a good bit of a go at it there. Yeah, that, that was a saltwater crocodile that uh, had a little bite out of it. Jonathan, this is so tiny, it's amazing. Tell me how it works. Well, we have a, a, essentially a camera at the front, yep. and um, at the back here we've got a, a polymer battery and a little uh, transmitter, which is uh, a microwave transmitter. Wherever he puts it, as long as he's got a line of sight, Jonathan can track the tiny camera with a dish while standing at a safe distance. Attached to the dish is a standard camcorder, and that's what records the amazing footage the tiny camera can get. is held together with nothing more complicated than some gaffer tape and a bit of glue. And often, Jonathan will use it with no protective casing at all. Because the kit is so simple, total destruction isn't a problem. Jonathan just picks up the pieces, takes them home and rebuilds the camera. The perfect kit if you want shots from the centre of the action. But for anything else, you'll probably be using an off-the-shelf camcorder. And I'm going to be testing three of the toughest a little bit later on. After checking they can withstand a workout down the gym, I'm going to get violent and push them to the very edge of destruction. Now it's time for another of our regular guides designed to help you get the most from your gadgets. This week, the important subject of how to reformat your PC. Spyware can really slow down your computer. It stows away on your hard drive without you even knowing it. Deleting data, uninstalling programs, running anti-spyware software and defragging can help speed it up again. But if it doesn't, reach for the installation disk and reformat your computer. Reformatting means deleting everything from your hard disk and starting again from scratch. So the first thing to do is make a note of all the programs you like using, then make a copy of every file you want to keep. You can burn about 700 megabytes of documents and data to a CD, or about 5 gigabytes to a DVD. But it's best to back up to a removable hard drive. This 160 gigabyte one cost us £100. But remember, always double check that your backup has worked before you wipe your PC completely clean. Over 90% of home computers now run Windows XP, so that's what we'll concentrate on. When you bought your computer, it should have come with a CD containing the XP operating system. Insert the disk and turn your computer off. 
Then turn your computer back on and select the option to boot from the CD. It's always best to choose the slower format option. It may take a lot longer, but it does a much more thorough job of clearing out your system. Then just wait while XP loads up onto your computer. The majority of drivers for your mouse, keyboard, speakers and monitor will be on the disc too, so you won't need to reinstall them. So your operating system is back on a fresh hard drive and your PC has been restored to its original state. Now it's time to reinstall your antivirus software along with your favourite programmes and transfer your saved data back over onto your computer. Everything should be running at peak performance, so it's worth using the handy System Restore function. It looks at the hard drive now and saves it as a template for future use. Should things ever slow down again, you can avoid the whole reformatting process and simply tell your computer to return to this point in time, when you were happy it was in its best state. Reformatting is considered by some to be good practice, with speed fiends doing it every six months or so. It can take a bit of time and you must be confident that you've backed up everything that's vital. But it's a great way to make your computer as lean and mean as the day you bought it. If you find our mini gadget show guides useful when it comes to getting the most out of your technology, we'll be delighted to know there are lots more of them on our website at 5.tv forward slash gadget show. Whether you want to know how to find lost documents, boost your Wi-Fi signal, or even load VHS footage onto your PC, our numerous guides are designed to make the process as easy as possible. Just go to the website and click on downloads and there they are. Here's a real piece of gadget history for you. This is the Osborne One. It was launched in 1981 and was the world's first commercially available portable computer. It had two floppy drives, a tiny 5-inch screen, 64K of RAM and two 91K hard drives. Not very impressive by today's standards, but even though the term wasn't even invented back then, this was the original laptop. 25 years later and things have moved on, a lot. After years of being the expensive but inferior alternative to desktop PCs, laptops are now just as good value and just as powerful. But with the added attraction of being neat, compact and of course, portable. In fact, the last few months of 2005 finally saw sales of laptops overtake those of their bulky desk-bound relatives. Personally, I couldn't live without my laptop. It means I can stay connected pretty much anywhere. And with the growing profusion of Wi-Fi hotspots that are popping up everywhere and getting faster all the time, these sleek, sexy, go-anywhere machines are most definitely the future. No, no, I wasn't talking to you. And they're even taking on the desktop at its own game, chosen more and more as a neater, space-saving home computer alternative to a whopping great PC tower and miles of cables. The problem is, of course, with laptops now so hugely popular, all the big boys of the computer world want to cash in. And there's a dizzying array to choose from, with a dizzying array of specs at a dizzying array of prices. But fear not, because you have a friend who knows his stuff. It's me. So, sit back and relax. But also, sit up and pay attention, as I give you the Gadget Show Laptop Buyer's Guide. Laptops fall into three basic categories based on size. The babies, the big boys, and the in-betweens. First up are the babies, neat little packages with screens under 12 inches. There's no questioning the fact that this Toshiba libretto is a beautiful creation. It's almost small enough to slip in a pocket. It weighs less than a kilogram, and yet it's packing a reasonable punch in terms of processing power and memory. The problem with computers this small is that they're this small. That keyboard really is too tiny to type on properly, and that screen during prolonged use, I think, would become hard on the eyes. What you need is something bigger. Don't get carried away, though, and go for one of the big boys. This beast of a machine is the Rock Extreme 64. It's actually designed as a gaming computer you can move around, and it's the first laptop in the world to have dual processors. 
This is one very fast machine. But it's a pretty heavy machine, weighing in at just under six kilograms. That's the equivalent of carrying four bags of flour around with you. There's no doubt it'll get some looks at gaming parties, but it's hardly practical for everyday use. In fact, I reckon anything over 15 inches is excessive for a laptop and will prove tricky to carry around. By the same token, anything under 12 inches will have you squinting if you use it a lot. Luckily, there are a whole raft of laptops in that middleweight category. And unlike a few years ago, when you had to pay through the nose for these things, there are now some pretty impressive machines for just a few hundred quid. Make sure you check out the specs, though. Some machines are cheap simply because they're rubbish. But for under a grand, you should find plenty that includes all of these features. No heavier than three kilograms. A battery life of three plus hours five plus hours if you can find it. When it comes to RAM, we recommend a minimum of 512 megabytes. A gigabyte, though, is better. Your hard drive, at least 60 gigabytes. Your processor, a minimum of 1.5 gigahertz, or 1.7 gigahertz should be achievable within a budget. When it comes to graphics, for normal use, a 32 megabyte graphics card should see you OK but 64 megabytes and upwards is better if you intend to play games. Most laptops now come with integrated Wi-Fi. It might be something you need to ask about. At least two USB slots. And finally, a DVD writer. Stick to those sort of specs and you'll have a perfectly capable machine, even if style is important to you. Join us later in the program when John will be testing budget price machines that match all of these requirements. Ready? Sure am. Ready? Yep. Okay. So stick around to find out which laptop gets the Gadget Show seal of approval. Now, it's time for our regular look at some of the coolest gadgets around. This week, things you can stick in your USB socket. Here's Tom Dunmore with The Critical List. You're no doubt familiar with USB as a way to connect your computer to digital cameras, MP3 players and the like. But you might not be aware that it also has hidden talents. As well as sending data to and from your PC, USB can also send electricity, which means it can power a whole world of weird and wonderful widgets like these. But it's not just cute desktop accessories. I've managed to find a surprising range of really innovative USB plugins. First up, speakers. If you're not happy with the sound quality you're getting out of your computer, but your budget can't quite stretch to the £600 you'll need for some Eclipse TDs, there are some pretty worthwhile USB alternatives out there, such as this speaker from Boink. This plugs into the USB port for power and into the headphone socket for sound. You just hit the top, and as you can hear, it's a pretty good sound. You can even personalise it for your, your own taste with this treble and bass switch and, of course, there's a, a volume in the middle. But if you want something that works in harmony with your computer's speakers rather than instead of them, how about this? It's a USB-powered subwoofer from SciTech. Like the Boink, it plugs into your USB port and headphone socket. And as you can hear, it really enhances the bass on your system, so it's perfect if you like dance music or drum and bass. USB data storage has been undergoing something of a renaissance of late too. More and more people are getting used to backing up their important data to removable USB drives, like this one. And the drives themselves are getting smaller and smaller. This, incredibly, will hold 60 gigabytes of data. That's enough for 15,000 songs and it's got its own USB cable built in. Alternatively, you could use flash memory storage. This is a data card and it's credit card thin. Look at that, absolutely incredible. And yet it's still got a USB built in. 
Now this one will store 128 megabytes. That's enough for your important documents. But soon you'll be able to get these in up to one gigabyte capacity, and then it'll be absolutely invaluable. If you fancy a media center PC, but really don't want to spend a grand buying one, there's a USB plug-in for that too. These are essentially little shrunken down free view boxes and they bring digital terrestrial television to your desktop. You can even record programs straight to your hard drives. And because they're USB powered and come with this tiny little aerial, you really can watch whatever you want, wherever you are. How come I wasn't invited to go along on this? It's time to return to the subject of camcorders now and our search for the toughest you can buy. If you want a rugged, ready-for-anything camcorder, then we reckon one of these is probably what you need. They take the knocks and blows better than your traditional camcorder because they record onto flash memory. Flash memory has a tough reputation on the gadget show. When we tested memory devices last year, the only survivor was a USB memory stick using flash memory. It's solid state, so there are no moving parts, which means even if it looks as battered as this, you can still retrieve data from it. In comparison, tape is notoriously problematic. When the tape is wound around the camera heads, any rigorous shaking can make it jump and cause distortion. So we're going to test the theory that recording onto solid state memory makes cameras better at filming on the move. First up, the Panasonic SDR-S100. It's the most expensive of our three cameras, and Panasonic claim it's shock and humidity proof. We decided to test the shock proof bit with a workout. We chose a step class because constant bouncing around is just the sort of thing that would cause a tape camera to trip up. So, can this little box survive? Well, the footage is jerky and shaky, as you'd expect, but the camera never stops recording and there's no dropout on the footage. Next is the Samsung X110L, which is marketed as a camera for sports enthusiasts. Samsung make no claims of ruggedness for the main camera. It's the external lens that they call an extreme sports camera module. We tested it with Mario, whose extreme sport is breakdancing. But with just a 40 centimetre cable linking the camera and the module, it's hard to think where they expect you to stow the main unit while the lens is getting extreme. Our breakdancer Mario actually kept his moves quite slow. Apparently he prefers a shinier floor normally, but even so, there are purple glitches along the bottom of the picture. Not a great start for the Samsung. Lastly, it's the turn of the Oregon Scientific. This ATC-1000 is not your everyday camcorder. It's $99 of pure rugged simplicity. One tube with four buttons, a lens, a memory card and six batteries. By far the easiest to use and the most extreme looking. So we thought we'd beat the hell out of it with some Taekwondo. It will only record two minutes of footage at a time and it only films at 15 frames per second, so it has got its limitations. But then, it is meant for recording the exhilaration of a bass jump, rather than the speeches at a wedding. The slow frame rate does make for jumpy footage, but there are no glitches or dropout. So, the Samsung has already started to crack under the pressure, but the other two have already proved their hardcore camcorder credentials. In the next part of our testing, we're going to push them to the limits with water, vibration and a lot of fire. Earlier, Jason told us the minimum spec you should look for if you're buying a laptop. And if you haven't bought one recently, you could be forgiven for thinking he had rather high expectations. Built-in wireless, a DVD writer, a 1.5 gigahertz minimum processor, and 512 megabytes of RAM are his starting point. And on top of that, the battery's got to be good for at least three hours, and the whole thing's got to weigh no more than three kilos. A tall order, 
Well, actually, no. These days, there are lots of competitively priced laptops that meet those specifications. But how do you choose between them? Well, I've selected three particularly promising looking examples. I'm going to subject them to some intensive testing. First of the bunch is this LNX ProWire 153EG. It lays claim to a class-leading battery life, but could be let down by not being widescreen. Then there's the Gateway MX6635B. It may not be the prettiest laptop in the world, but it does look altogether more media-friendly with its modern widescreen. It also boasts a 100GB hard drive, wireless and a gig of RAM, and is the cheapest of the bunch. Smaller, lighter and arguably better looking than the other two is the Sony Veo FJ1S. It comes with an impressive software bundle. Photographers may appreciate Adobe's Photoshop elements, and there's also Premiere video editing software. But this is the most expensive of the three. So, speed, and you'll find all these machines well capable of your day-to-day -day word processing, emails and web browsing. But what really pushes a computer is multitasking, opening lots of different programs and web pages at once. And one of the most intensive things you can do is video editing. So, to really test the speed and power of the processor, we shot some DV footage, loaded it into our laptops and added effect after effect after effect. A particularly tricky process for any computer to handle. Then, we rendered the movie at its highest resolution and set it playing in Media Player. Finally, as icing on the cake, we did a word count of the complete works of Shakespeare. The gateway played on without any noticeable difference. The Veo started huffing and puffing and making a bit of a noise when it hit the effect-heavy sections, but made it to the end happily. The LNX, though, fell at the final hurdle. As it reached the end, it stuttered and froze. It was a good effort, but not quite good enough. Now, there's one aspect of laptop design that I think is all too often overlooked. Can you read the screen in bright light? I mean, when you're writing your novel, you want to be free to wander wherever the mood takes you. You don't want your creativity to be stifled by constantly having to squint. We took exactly the same stroll out into the bright daylight with each of our laptops to see which one handled the glare of the sun best. The LNX's standard TFT screen has a sort of frosted surface, which evenly reflects the light. Fine inside, but outside it's like looking at the text through a fog. You can see it most of the time, but it's not ideal. The Sony prides itself on its X-Black screen. The coatings in the screen minimise the reflected light, in theory making the background as black as possible. And it does work. There's a lot of reflections, but the text remains quite clear. What about the gateway, then? Well, it's got its own kind of X-Black screen, but it doesn't look quite as bright or as sharp as the Sony. In fact, I'd say it was possibly too reflective, working as quite a nice mirror in the really bright light. When you compare all three, it's the Sony that's the clear winner. Its lauded X-Black screen really does live up to the hype. Finally, the most critical test of all, battery life. How long do they really last? Well, obviously, that depends on what you're doing. Take playing a DVD, for example. All that video processing and a drive to power, that should be a tough test. We've set the brightness on each machine at the same level. Each laptop's power management setting is the same, and all the DVDs are running through Media Player for similar power usage, which will stay alive the longest. After one hour and 54 minutes, the Sony was the first to drop out. You'd be lucky to watch an entire movie with that battery life. Then the LNX left the race. For a machine that prides itself on battery life, it didn't have enough to win today's challenge, with a time of two hours and 19 minutes of continuous play. 
The honours go to the Gateway. It was close. It ran out of power a mere five minutes later, but a battery life of two hours and 24 minutes was enough to win this test. All the laptops coped surprisingly well with our tests, and all of them offer genuinely good value for money. I know people who've been put off buying a well-specced, cheaper model purely on the assumption that if it costs less, it can't really be any good. Well, that's obviously rubbish. You really can get a good, cheap laptop, but which one do I recommend? Well, it's close, but after doing the best job on the video editing and triumphing in our battery life test, it's the Gateway that's our best budget laptop. And brilliantly, it's also the cheapest one we tested. time to return to our camcorders. We've already put three models that claim some degree of sportiness to the test with a workout down the gym. The pretty standard looking but rugged Panasonic worked perfectly. The Samsung with its extreme sports camera module may have shown a couple of glitches, but the truly extreme Oregon Scientific wasn't at all bothered by some pretty violent kicks. So these little camcorders have proved that they're pretty much shockproof in the gym, but can they cut it when it comes to extreme outdoor pursuits? We've devised some very nasty tests that'll push them well beyond anything they were ever designed to survive. What we want to know is just how much punishment they can stand before meltdown occurs. Test one is vibration. Now we really want these camcorders to endure some serious vibration. So Steve here is going to take them out on his bike and give them a good going over. We've got the Panasonic on the front of the bike, giving you a frontal view. At the back, we've got the Oregon. And then finally, on the top of Steve's helmet, we've got the Samsung and the recorder in his pocket. Ready to go? Take it away. After a punishing 15-minute bike ride, it's time to de-rig and check the footage. Our laptops got the software for all the cameras pre-loaded, and the Panasonic and Oregon pick is download in seconds. That's, I was going to say, it's much less blurry than the other one, isn't it? That's a much clearer shot. We can't actually get the footage off the Samsung and have to view it on the camera monitor, but it is there. Despite enormous vibration, all the cameras did keep recording throughout the ride. Next up, a touch of toasting. We want to see just how much heat our camcorders can stand. So we've enlisted the help of the Gadget Show's very own special effects man, Graham Brown, and he has made us a flamethrower. Our flamethrower runs on propane, which burns at almost 500 degrees Celsius. Hot sunny days have been known to kill cameras, so this has got to hurt them. OK, thank you, Graham. Let's have a look. See if they've stood that test right. First of all, the Panasonic. Well, I think we can safely say that it's been well and truly toasted on the lens. It's melted like a marshmallow, whereas the Samsung's escaped pretty much unscathed. And then finally, the Oregon. Yeah, you can see that's suffering a little bit of burn damage there. Amazingly, though, all three cameras have recorded dramatic pictures of the flames, and they still work perfectly. Having warmed our camcorders up, it's time now to cool them down with a bit of a splashing. Fire and rescue boys at Wolverhampton are going to fill that area there with water. OK, take it away, boys. We're going to put the camcorders on the edge, and then Steve is going to ride through on his motorbike and give them a damn good splashing. Water can be a killer for powered-up electronic gadgets. Basically, it acts as a conductor causing short circuits. And bang, things start to go wrong. God, I can hardly see them. They're so covered in mud. See, they still work. 
They really are in a state, but despite this, the Panasonic still downloads, and again, the quality is top rate. <laughs> the Oregon stutters for a moment, <coughs> but then springs to life, and we get our pictures. That was it. Last is the Samsung. It's not happy and will only reveal a dreaded error message. And it says an MPEG decoding error. With three tests in, there's just one more to go. Well, you can't say that we haven't put these little guys through their paces. They've endured extreme vibrations, been flame grilled, and then had a thorough soaking. And they're all still working. OK, the Samsung is faltering a little, but it's still hanging in there. So now, in true gadget show tradition, we're going to blow them up. We've got our explosives in the shed behind me and the camcorders right here. But the big question is, will our fireball finish them off? As well as heat and debris, they'll have to withstand a massive pressure wave travelling at 13,000 miles per hour. At the centre of the explosion, temperatures will have reached almost 4,000 degrees. Surely we'd killed them this time. That is what you call the big bang, isn't it? Have a look. <gasps> Serious meltdown. Once they'd cooled down enough to touch, I checked our rugged trio. Amazingly, the Panasonic was still recording, and its footage from the explosion was pretty dramatic. The Oregon had also survived and provided an equally spectacular shot of the Big Bang. Finally, though, the Samsung had died. Its rubberized body had melted away, exposing its very delicate insides to the full force of the fire. But, like the other two camcorders, it still deserves a lot of respect for just how much torture it endured. These really are three very tough camcorders. Goodbye. in 2001 by a Swiss figure skater called Stefan Soda. Tired of always having to roll a The image quality on the 360 fly really isn't very good at all. You immediately notice the limitations of the single lens. You've got